Hello again, this is Professor Watson. Today we are ready to start to put together some ingredients of economic analysis that we've built up so far and really develop a theory of how the entire competitive market economy functions. But first I want to go back and review just briefly what we've uh, discussed so far in terms of markets for individual goods and equilibrium prices. Remember, equilibrium means that we maximize the gains from trade. That's a good thing. We can visualize that in terms of the surplus triangle. And if you remember from our equilibrium lecture, if the price was above or below equilibrium in the Econville gas market, we had the quantity reduced to 3,000. We could have had all these deals from 3,000 up to the equilibrium made, and it would have been gains for the buyers because the price would have been below their valuation on the demand curve, and gains for these sellers because that price would have been above their cost level on the supply curve. So we had all this surplus left on the table when we weren't at equilibrium. Well, in a free market, these prices will get adjusted. If the price is too high, these excluded sellers and buyers can agree at a slightly lower price, and if the price is too low, the excluded buyers can raise the price. And so the market process will kick in and we'll get back to equilibrium, and in reality, in reality, with free markets, we you can think about it in one of two ways. We're either kind of always at equilibrium or we're always really close to equilibrium and moving toward a new equilibrium. And while, while some economists will kind of debate that, in my view, it's irrelevant. Equilibrium is active and markets are, are moving to, to give us the maximum gains from trade. Markets are efficient, which is also a good thing. And remember, we can divide the value or demand curve and cost or supply curve into two sections at equilibrium. And at equilibrium, only high-valued uses are engaged in and they're supplied by the lowest cost sources of supply. So we're getting the most value for the least cost and that is the definition of efficiency. We're excluding people's uses that aren't very valuable and we're excluding sources of supply that have higher costs. All this is done automatically by people making their own decisions based on looking at the equilibrium price and, de and deciding whether they should be buying or selling or doing nothing at all. And finally, one thing we should touch on is that equilibrium tells the truth about the reality of the value and cost of any particular product, and that also is a very good thing. Right? When we don't have equilibrium, for instance, in the situation where we have price controls kicking in, like the anti-price gouging measures that kicked in and prevented gas prices from rising the necessary amount to achieve a equilibrium level in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and these basically acted as price ceilings which kept this price below equilibrium and that caused a shortage, a very predictable shortage, and that caused a lot of needless pain and suffering, waiting in line, and actually people reverting to desperate measures to use means other than money to purchase a highly needed commodity. And if you can't pay higher money prices, people will find other ways to pay, including this kind of dehumanizing and undignified means of payment. So we need to respect the equilibrium, what it means, what it does for us. Equilibrium price is a very good thing, even if that price is higher than we would want it to be. Of course, in an ideal world, everything would be free, but that equilibrium price reflects the truth about the actual scarcity of the good relative to its value, and it tells me exactly what I need to pay if I want to access the good. Okay, so we can move on now and we'll think about the entire economy. The entire economy consists of markets for all goods and services. What are those equilibrium prices that we've just discussed what do they do for us well what they do is they coordinate all of our activities they guide us in our consumption decisions they guide us in our production decisions prices are really the guidance system or the brains if you will of the economy although they work in an interesting impersonal spontaneous manner that no single person or group of people has knowledge of or control over A very fascinating process prices coordinate our actions by providing us with information incentives and encouraging innovation on the part of entrepreneurs, as we will discuss shortly. It's crucial to understand the role of the entrepreneur in all of this. We want to think about entrepreneurs as people who are in, in business, producing goods and services, with the goal of making a profit. Now, to assess whether a particular business is prospectively profitable or not, entrepreneurs' fundamental task is to envision the price relationship between the product, what, what a product can sell for, and the prices of its factors of production. So from an economic point of view, the main thing about entrepreneurship that we're interested in is that entrepreneurs' ability to see the prices, to see what a product is worth, and to see what the costs are of the factors of production, size up whether it would pay to produce that product or not. And once an entrepreneur finds a, a product and a business plan that he or she thinks is potentially profitable, 
Then they have to be involved in organizing, hiring all the factors of production, and managing the business operation. And then success or failure really depends on the market, or properly speaking, the consumers. If the consumers decide that the product is valuable enough and they're willing to buy it in sufficient quantity to cover the cost, the business becomes profitable. If the consumers decide otherwise, they're not willing to buy enough of the product or not buy it at a high enough price to cover costs, then the business will make losses. When we think about the entrepreneur and this economic function, this is kind of the image that, that I hope comes to mind. And this is actually inspired by my father, who was an entrepreneur and operated a construction business when I was young. So dad, by day, would be out on job sites and doing all kinds of work, managing a construction site, driving equipment, doing what was needed to keep a small business running. At night, often dad would be in his home office, uh, crunching the numbers on the adding machine. And remember that distinctive sound. And what dad would do would be to add up the prospective costs of performing a certain job and then construct a bid based on a, a price that would cover those costs. Dad would bid on many jobs, he would get some of them, and then he had, we had to go out and work trying to keep the costs low the whole time so that the job would return a profit to the business. So the, the number crunching aspect, of trying to find a business model, a business plan where the revenue from the products more than covers the cost of producing them. That's the crux of entrepreneurship from an economic point of view. Okay, now we should all be familiar with this. We'll do some basic accounting here just by way of review. The income statement equation, revenue minus expenses equals profit or loss. And profit, of course, means the revenue exceeds expenses. Loss means expenses are greater than revenue. As I mentioned, this is the heart and soul of what the entrepreneur does. And what we need to recognize here is that you cannot do income statement accounting without having prices for both the product, the output, and the inputs, the expenses. Notice that price is a crucial feature of the calculation of both revenue and expense. So what we'll start to see here is that only when we have prices for all goods throughout the economy can the entrepreneurs really do this function of, of calculating or estimating profit and loss and then making their business plans and decisions accordingly. If these are not equilibrium prices, they're not telling the truth, they're not coordinating our activities, they are not balancing quantity supplied and demanded, so they're worthless. They have to be equilibrium prices. When they are equilibrium prices, they reveal the truth about the value and scarcity of these goods. They give entrepreneurs a basis for making solid calculations and estimates and prognostication of the potential of various business plans. Now, of course, entrepreneurs don't have perfect foresight and their business plans will still need to be tested in the market to see whether they were right. A lot of it's guesswork, a lot of it's luck, a lot of it's experience, and a lot of it is hard-nosed accounting running the numbers again and again and again until you find something that works. Now let's turn to some examples. I like the auto industry. I'm a big car buff, especially old cars. It's hard to talk about the U.S. auto industry and, and great American entrepreneurs without bringing up Henry Ford. Now Ford was a, shall we say, quirky individual with a lot of flaws, but uh, nonetheless a, a brilliant engineer and a pretty good entrepreneur, although he had a lot of shortcomings. Um, you don't get 50% market share in the U.S. auto industry by being a slouch, and that's exactly what Ford accomplished in the 1920s. Hugely profitable in those early years, although one character flaw of Ford was that he was extremely stubborn, and he thought he had perfected the Model T. He was really unwilling to change his business plan. In the mid-1920s, a lot of his rivals had come out with uh, bigger and better and faster cars, and, and Ford was stubbornly sticking with his, his proven design, and it, it was a very low-cost design that they had really perfected and actually almost did Ford in in the late 1920s and his his higher executives really had to drag him kicking and screaming to abandon the Model T and to introduce the Model A in the late 20s. But nonetheless, Ford uh, accumulated massive fortune. By the time of his death in the 1940s, he was worth $200 billion plus in current money. So there's a great success story representing a profitable entrepreneur and the ability to grow and expand and deliver a great product to to millions and millions of consumers. Now, business failures usually don't get much press because businesses usually fail when they're quite small and people just kind of quietly move on with their lives. Occasionally, you have a sensational failure, a sudden collapse of an otherwise promising company. This is what happened to DeLorean, another automobile industry entrepreneur and pioneer. He had been a uh, executive with General Motors and had helped them achieve profitability. He was with Pontiac. I think he was with Chevrolet. He wanted to strike it out on his own and start his own car company. 
And they did build about 10,000, I think, of the uh, iconic uh, DeLorean car. You might remember it from the Back to the Future movies. But it had a lot of problems. The costs were high, and uh, they just couldn't make it. They couldn't get enough consumers to, to pay prices that covered the cost of production, and they had to shut down. A pretty spectacular business failure in the early 1980s. Those are just a few examples I want to serve to keep them in mind because we're going to talk about, well, what happens to the profit-making companies, what happens to the loss-making companies. And that's a, a crucial aspect of how the market process functions. But first, let's talk a little bit more about what profit and loss mean. Price is market value of a product, of a good. Profit means a finished product created by a business has a higher price than the sum of the, the prices of all the inputs. If wherever we see the word price, we replace that with market value, the profit means a finished product has a higher market value than the sum of the inputs. Then we can say a profit-making entrepreneur has increased the value of resources. And this is hugely important because we want to recognize that profit does not represent some kind of unearned gain, some kind of exploitation of the worker. Profit represents that the entrepreneur, through risk-taking and through the contribution of his or her knowledge and business acumen, has successfully operated a business enterprise that is proven to have created value for its consumers. If it weren't creating value for the consumers, they wouldn't be willing to pay the price sufficient to cover the cost of production. Okay, now likewise with loss, price is market value. Loss means the finished product has a lower price, a lower value than the sum of the prices of the inputs. So we can say a loss making entrepreneur has decreased the value of resources. Okay, so then we can ask this question, what should businesses or entrepreneurs do? Now, there's a lot of talk today about businesses should be involved in their communities, they should be socially responsible, they should take care of the environment, they should uh, address the concerns of stakeholders, and, and so on and so forth. Well, all that stuff might be well and good, but uh, really from an economic point of view, we really need one thing from businesses. We just said that profit was proof that the business has created value for consumers, and loss was proof that the business had destroyed value. So from the standpoint of consumers, all we really want from businesses is for them to pursue profits. This was stated very well by that great economist Milton Friedman in his book Capitalism and Freedom from 1962. He says, there was one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. And we might argue that uh, as long as we do have strong open competition, the deception and fraud stuff is going to take care of itself because businesses that do engage in deception and fraud and get caught, and they will eventually get caught, they tend to get weeded out of the process, they tend to lose the trust in favor of consumers, and they tend to go by the wayside. It's not a profitable long-term strategy to deceive the consumers or to attempt to defraud the consumers. Just ask Enron. Okay, so now we can put all these pieces together and then start to think about what it takes to have a flourishing prosperous economy. We want to consistently generate value creation with the scarce resources available and consistently avoid value destruction. So we have to reward profit makers and penalize loss makers. So how do we go about accomplishing this? Think about a system that would reward profit makers because they're creating value for consumers, they're using resources wisely, and punish loss makers who are using resources foolishly and not creating value, they're actually destroying value. You got any thoughts there? That's a little trick question. It's the market economy. The market process does this automatically because profits are their own reward and losses are their own penalty. So as long as we have a system wherein entrepreneurs have to look at prices, do the accounting, estimate whether a business plan would be profitable or not, and then go out and test it in the market, and what the market process is going to do is, is kind of automatically weed them out. Profitable businesses will automatically grow and flourish because they're creating value. Loss makers will automatically die off and fail because they're destroying value. So the market economy or the price system is going to accomplish this. It's going to provide us information for entrepreneurs to make the business decisions and then provide them incentives through profit and loss to act wisely, use resources well, create value for consumers, and finally to engage in innovation. Now, innovation is an important piece of this puzzle. In, in competitive markets, successful businesses, profitable businesses, will find that they are being imitated, they're being copied. They're being imitated and copied by rivals who are willing to cut the price in order to gain market share, as long as they can earn some amount of profit by doing so. So there's going to be strong incentives to innovate in terms of both creating better products in order to attract more customers and, and gain or maintain market share, and also in terms of pushing down the cost of production in order to maintain profitability, even in markets where the, the product is, is set, the, the product is well-defined and it's not really subject to innovation. So let's look at a few examples of that. 
product innovation, making the product consistently better and better. It's uh, very clear in the cell phone industry. Cell phones have actually been around since the 1970s. They didn't really become common until probably the 1990s. And even then, uh, still quite expensive, not so reliable. They've been improved consistently and, and rapidly until now we have the introduction of the smartphone in 07 with Apple. I recently bought a smartphone for the first time that cost me $40, and it has all the functionality of your, of your higher-end phones. It's just a little bit slower and a little bit lower quality camera, really. So what's going on here? Well, and notice in it, the companies, too. We've got Motorola, Mobira, Nokia, Ericsson, BlackBerry, Apple. Some of these companies are, have gone by the wayside or are currently tottering because they, they can't, they're not as innovative as others. Other companies have burst onto the scene that aren't even uh, noted here, such as Samsung. So what we have here is a very competitive market, and for firms to maintain profitability, they have to constantly improve the product, offer something newer and better that nobody else offers. And Apple has been consistently good at that. Samsung's been good at that as well. Who knows if they will continue to be good at that into the future? We have to uh, see what happens in the market test, see who will be the dominant player moving forward. However, we can be pretty confident, based on this past track record, that the products will continue to be improved upon and become more useful and attractive, and the costs will also be reduced as well as they find more and more efficient ways to produce them. Now, some products can't be improved upon. Some, some commodities are very well defined, and they are what they are. It doesn't mean innovation isn't possible. Crude oil is a well-defined product, and, and no oil companies come out and say, you know, we have a new improved barrel of oil. You know, all the taste, half the carbs. Now, a barrel of oil is a barrel of oils, but oil companies can go about increasing profitability by trying to get more oil out of a given well, get more oil out of a given investment of land, labor, and capital. There have been two huge innovations that have, that have come into play in recent years, although actually individually they both go back decades, but they've both kind of been really improved upon and combined in the last uh, 10 or so years that's led to a tremendous energy boom, especially in the United States, and that those are directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And you combine those together, they can do with one uh, drilling rig and, and one crew of workers today what it might have taken 10 rigs and, and hundreds of workers to do in past decades. No doubt the innovations will continue to be developed and the efficiencies will be increased as these oil companies continuously face a very competitive global environment. So we can do product innovation or process innovation. And that, that's a pretty durable result of a competitive market economy. Now, we're going to put all of this together and I have a little diagram, a little schematic that kind of encapsulates how this whole process works. Starting with trade, markets for all goods, and that means we have prices. And if we have free markets for all goods, those are equilibrium prices. They're telling the truth. They're coordinating our actions. They're giving valid information to entrepreneurs upon which they can create their business plans. So we have prices for land, for raw materials, energy, labor, buildings, so on and so forth. We have prices for all resources, all products. And that allows the entrepreneurs to do profit and loss accounting. Heart and soul, the economic function of the entrepreneur, crunching the numbers, trying to find a business plan that works, where the product can be sold at a price greater than the sum of the costs. So here's the entrepreneur with a new idea. Could be a huge innovation in terms of a brand new product, or it could just be bringing an existing product to a new market. Could be bringing in an existing product with better service, better quality. There's a million different ways to innovate. And the market is really a field where a, a thousand flowers can bloom, and then those that are the best will, will survive. The others will wither and fade away, and what we'll be left with is a very productive garden. Profit-making companies grow. They get the green light. They're able to hire more workers, buy more land, build more buildings, rent more equipment, and so on and so forth. And that's a good thing because profit, remember, is a sign of creating value for consumers. So this is exactly what we would want to happen. And here's an example going back to our oil boom that's been the product of tremendous innovation in the production of oil. This has lowered the price of oil. And as you can see from this article from uh, 2014, this led to an uh, expansion of oil refining because the profits for oil refiners increased as the cost of their main raw material input went down. So the price there reliably sent a signal to, to all the connected industries. The price of your input goes down, the supply curve shifts right, profits are perceived to be increasing, and those industries expand. Now on the flip side, we have the loss maker. The business doesn't pan out. It could be from bad planning, could be from bad luck. It doesn't matter. The fact is that the price of the product is not covering costs. And what needs to happen here? What happens here? What needs to happen? Well, what does happen is that these businesses fail and go out of business 
liquidate their inventories, shut down their stores, lay off their workers, so on and so forth. So one of my favorite headlines here from uh, 2013 about Blockbuster going out of business or at least uh, dramatically reducing their scale. And I like to ask the students who killed Blockbuster. Of course, if you've been paying attention much at all, you'll know that this is uh, Netflix, uh, Redbox is maybe an accomplice, Amazon Prime, streaming video. Uh, Blockbuster's business model just became outmoded fairly rapidly due to the growth in the on-demand streaming video services. So Blockbuster, which was a great company, which if you can remember back into the 80s and 90s, renting the tapes, you know, you had to be kind, rewind, you had to race back to the store before midnight to make sure you didn't get a late penalty. Well, that was a, a fine and dandy business model at the time, but it's been surpassed by technology and innovation from its rivals, no longer creating value the way they can, and so it has to meet its demise. It's not personal, son. It's strictly business. And the nice thing about when a business dies, the people don't die. The buildings can be used for other purposes. The workers who are released can go on to new careers and new jobs. And so while, while it might be sad to see businesses go, it's absolutely vital for the success of the economy. Where, where remember, scarcity is the main problem. Scarce resources that have alternative uses. Blockbuster is using resources in a way that don't create value. Those resources need to be released and go back into the market to seek employment where they can produce value. And what losses are is a red light to the business. They're telling the business to, to stop wasting resources. You ultimately just shut down. If you can't turn a profit, you're going to have to shut down. You're not creating value. The markets are not going to give you resources anymore. So we can put all this together now. We've got the green light and the positive feedback, the growth that happens for profit-making companies. They, they can acquire more resources. They can grow and expand as long as they continue making profits. The market's basically telling them, we like what you're doing. Keep on doing it. Do more until such time that you don't make profits anymore. And when you make losses, the market will show you that red light and take away your resources, forcing you into failure, into bankruptcy. You, you won't have a cash flow that enables you to continue paying for inputs, to hire workers, to, to pay rent on buildings and machinery and so on. So when the combination of this positive feedback of profits and negative feedback of losses, we can s realize that we, we're going to have economic growth as an automatic outcome here. If we reward that which creates value consistently and penalize and, and kind of snuff out that, that which destroys value, what are we going to get in the long run? Well, we're going to get value creation in the long run. And that's how the market process works in a nutshell to provide continual growth, prosperity, and innovation, and really make a competitive market economy a really nice place to live. Because what we have is an army of entrepreneurs who are constantly competing against each other to come up with newer and better and cheaper products for the mass of the consumers, which is all of us. And one of my favorite economists, Ludwig von Mises here, uh, recognizes this and celebrates the profit makers because profit makers have basically passed the test of value creation for the consumers. And von Mises said success in business is proof of services rendered to the consumers.